Hello, beloved. Welcome to worship today at St. Martin's Lutheran Church. It is good to be with you all. A few announcements as we begin our worship today. You'll notice we have two devices recording tonight. We are experimenting with going live through Facebook. As we announced last week during worship, doing two services in a weekend has been putting a strain on our already small volunteer group and our staff. And so this will be our last Saturday evening service. We will be moving to Sunday mornings only at 9.30 again, as we had previously. We will be working to live stream at 9.30 so that people can join us immediately. We will still make sure that this is posted to YouTube and sent out in as many ways as possible. We don't want to exclude anyone from worship. Uh, we are continuing to try to learn as we go and continue to figure out how we can best serve the St. Martin's community. But to that end, I continue to encourage you here and at home uh, as we watch the numbers rising once again in very scary ways. Please do continue to wear your masks over your mouth and nose. Continue to social distance. Be safe, beloved, in all things. We are in the middle of stewardship season. Gene Short is with us to share a word about stewardship. Come on forward, Gene, and the uh, floor is yours. As many of you uh, know from um, the announcements that have started going out that um, we are starting our stewardship campaign. Um, I'm Jean Shore here on behalf of the stewardship committee of Jason Lindquist, uh, Robin Russo, and myself. Um, we're doing stewardship a little different this year, um, which I guess is fitting to 2020 since it has been a different year. Um, we're only doing the um, financial giving campaign this fall. Um, we're going to look at stewardship this next year as a year-round way of living. And each quarter, we will look at doing a stewardship um, event. And one of those will be time and talent at a later point. Um, our campaign theme is faith, hope, and charity. Um, your stewardship uh, invitation for giving went in the mail today, so watch for your envelope this next week. Um, I am here to give you a stewardship challenge. As um, many of you know, um, I am creative, but that usually is with a paintbrush or a needle and thread. Um, but as I was going through, um, the mailing labels to check and see that we hadn't missed anybody and the addresses were um, correct and stuff, a thought came to me as what if. Um, so the challenge tonight uh, that I'm going to give you is <clears throat> when I looked at those and did a little mathematical calculation, um, I'm going to challenge each um, person at St. Martin's to um, increase their pledge by $5. If we did that, and, I, and that's for the oldest in the group to the confirmed um, new teenagers who probably have never made a pledge uh, before. But if we each increased by $5, we could increase, we could have $8,000 to um, do God's work um, in a different way or sustain some program um, to make it more ongoing. So think about it and pray about it. And as you look at um, your giving and put your pledge together, um, please uh, take uh, the challenge seriously and um, 
as it was announced, Pledge Sunday is December 6th, so come with your envelope or put it in the mail so we have it by the 6th so that the council will be able to work on a budget for 2021. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask Jason, Robin, or myself. Give us a call since we're not all in person um, as we usually are. Um, and I'll leave you with a thought that is a part of our campaign. Um, as David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So center your thoughts on that as you look forward to seeing what we can do um, with our hands when God puts, puts them to work in the new year. Thank you. Beloved, let us begin our worship with confession. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, in whose image we are made, who claims us and calls us beloved. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Holy One, we confess that we are not awake for you. We are not faithful in using your gifts. We forget the least of our siblings. We do not see your beautiful image in one another. We are infected by sin that divides your beloved community. Open our hearts to your coming. Open our eyes to see you in our neighbor. Open our hands to serve your creation. Amen. Beloved, we are God's children, and Jesus, our beloved, opens the door to us. Through Jesus, you are forgiven. By Jesus, you are welcome. In Jesus, you are called to rejoice. Let us live in the promises prepared for us from the foundation of the world. Amen. I invite you to join your hearts and voices with us in our gathering song, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Thank you. Communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. 
O God of power and might, your Son shows us the way of service, and in him we inherit the riches of your grace. Give us the wisdom to know what is right and the strength to serve the world you have made. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to be seated. A reading from the first chapter of the book of Ephesians, beginning with the 15th verse. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, and for this reason I do not cease to give thanks for you, as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority, and power, and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet, and has made him the head over all things for the church which is his body, the fullness of him, who fills all in all. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to our psalm tonight is Psalm 95, verses 1 through 7. The congregation is invited to read the bold verses. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before God's presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to the Lord with songs. For you, Lord, are a great God and a great ruler above all God. In your hand are the caverns of the earth, and the heights of the hills are also yours. The sea is yours, for you made it, and your hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our name. For the Lord is our God, and we are the people of God's pasture and the sheep of God's hand. I invite you to rise as you're able for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick. And you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. The righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? When was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? The king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these, who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, you that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me, 
naked and you did not give me clothing, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? And he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it, one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord. I invite you to be seated. Grace and peace be to you from God our Creator and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, at the start of the school year, Ryan's math class was learning about coins. And so every day after class, she wanted to do more. And I dumped out a bit of change, and she would sort the coins in piles, sometimes by their denomination, other times by color or size or whether the coins had the ridges around the edge or not. A couple weeks later, her science class started talking about physical properties. And we found objects from all over the house to classify as hard or soft, rough or smooth, big or small, plastic, metal, wood, or shape and color. The more she learns, the more Ryan seems to enjoy practicing sorting things. Just the other day, Ryan informed me that there are different kinds of soil, and apparently whatever we scraped out of our yard was humus. <laughs> Thus begins my six-year-old learning things that I don't know. <laughs> now, sorting tends to be a big part of our lives. We sort all kinds of things. When you log into Netflix, Netflix or Hulu, or whatever streaming service you like, you don't have to search through hundreds of titles. They are sorted into genre, action, sci-fi, horror, rom-com. When you order DoorDash, the restaurants you are given the option to order from are sorted by fast food, chicken, burgers, Mexican, Italian, Greek, barbecue. Speaking of food, if you've ever tried to diet, you'll know that foods can be sorted by macronutrients. And that will help you get the right amount of proteins, carbs, or fats. We learn to sort our laundry. Although don't tell my mother, from time to time I throw it all in together. Nothing's come out pink yet. Baseball has the National League and the American League. Football has the National Football Conference and the American Football Conference. College sports has the SEC and, I don't know, whatever conferences don't have the Georgia Bulldogs. There are even folks who sort their M&Ms by color, and some will swear to you that they taste different. I'm not one of them. It turns out God is a sorter too. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory, Jesus says. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. The sheep are the righteous who will be welcomed into the kingdom prepared for them. The goats are the accursed who will be cast out into eternal fire. And it would seem that the central distinction between the sheep and the goats, the righteous and the accursed, is justice. The king says to the righteous, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. And the righteous seem surprised. They ask, Lord, when was it we did any of these things for you? Perhaps they cannot even recall a time when their Lord was in such need. The king replies, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these members of my family, you did it for me. 
when the righteous had compassion for those in need, when they gave of what they had to those who had not, they were pursuing justice and equity, and the king has taken note of this. Just as the righteous are surprised, the accursed are doubly surprised. They ask, now wait just a second, when did we ever see you in need and not take care of you? These seemingly cannot remember a time when they did do right by the king. But the king says again, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. When they did not do what they could to help those in need, when they did not share their abundance to end the scarcity of another, they perpetuated injustice and inequity. And the king has taken note of that as well. Beloved, I am always struck by the surprise of the righteous and accursed in this parable. And I can't help but think of some of Jesus' interactions with the Pharisees. For instance, when Jesus healed a man's hand on the Sabbath, the Pharisees came to Jesus and said, It's not permitted to work on the Sabbath. Why didn't you wait till another day? And Jesus responds that it is better to give life than to take it. So often, Jesus confronted the hypocrisy of the religious elite, calling them out for being so rigid in following the letter of the law that they had forgotten. That the reason the law exists to begin with is to guard the life and dignity of every person. And that's not unique to Jesus. We've seen it in our readings for the past couple of weeks. As the prophets rail against the self-righteousness and hypocrisy of those who practiced piety without purpose, who have given offerings but withheld mercy, who have celebrated their righteousness without fulfilling their responsibility. And I wonder, beloved, if this is where sorting sometimes gets us into trouble. Because as much as it is important to sort coins by denomination, what happens when we let our religious denominations and backgrounds define us more than our love in action? As much as it is important to discern how much of a macronutrient my body needs, what happens when we make ourselves judge over the legitimacy of the need of another? As much as it is important to separate sports teams into leagues or conferences, what happens when we are more concerned with who is on our team than we are with repairing the breach that divides communities and families? The truth is, church, that too often we let our comfort get in the way of our compassion. Too often we let our judgment hold us back from seeking justice. Too often we use our rights as an excuse to avoid our responsibility. Too often we talk about our religion, but we don't live out our faith. And it can be so easy to let excuses replace actions. It can be so easy to find reasons why this need is not my problem or that person is not my responsibility. But the more we do that, church, the more we will struggle to even see the hungry and the thirsty the naked and the sick, the immigrant and the imprisoned. When we cannot see the hungry, what hope have we of feeding them? When we shut our ears to the cry of the thirsty, how can we possibly give them something to drink? When we judge the nakedness of our neighbor, then how can we clothe them in dignity and grace? When we shame the sickness of our neighbor, what healing is within our power to give? If we fear what is different about our neighbor, then how is it possible to love them into community? If we will not acknowledge the systems and situations that make hostages of our neighbor, what chance is there that we can work for their liberation? The thing is, folks, this is not about salvation. Yes, we believe that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection have ensured our salvation. Yes, we affirm that we are justified by grace through faith apart from works. Yes, we trust that the King of Heaven has claimed us 
and called us children. But faith is not fire insurance. The motivation of our religion should never be reduced to fear of hell or reward of heaven. The central truth of the gospel is not just about eternal life after we die, but abundant life while we live. So many people carry the scars left by blind churches that were so focused on heaven that they couldn't see the hell folks were living in now. So many people have been deeply wounded by selfish saints who talked about their personal relationship with Jesus even as they severed their relationship with those who thought differently than them. So many people have limped away from empty religion that wields the Bible like a weapon and does not understand that every word of Scripture is a love letter written in the blood of the Christ who gave his life for love of us. When Paul wrote to the Ephesians, he said he gave thanks for them because of their faith in the Lord Jesus and their love toward all the saints. The two cannot be divorced from each other. Love is what faith in action looks like. And Paul prays that the disciples of Jesus Christ in Ephesus and in every place might have the eyes of our hearts enlightened so that, he writes, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe according to the working of his great power. Paul says this power was put into place when Christ was raised from the dead. It is active in his ruling over all things, and it is shown in the church, which is the body of Christ on earth. If we were to keep reading into chapter 2, we would hear this. We are what God has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. God does not need our good works, beloved, but our neighbor does. We were created to be compassionate. We were made to show mercy. Justice is to be our way of life. On this Christ the King Sunday, beloved, we are reminded that we are all at once both children and subjects of the King. As children of God, we have received the full measure of God's mercy and grace. As subjects of God, we are meant to be good stewards of these gifts, reaching out in love to the least of these. In our baptismal vows, we promise to strive for justice and peace in all the earth. Peace is both our inheritance and our imperative. Justice is both our right and our responsibility. Our very lives are meant to be an offering to the one who has held back no good thing from us and who promises to give us life abundant and eternal. So come, beloved. Let us sing to the Lord. May the joyful noise we make be a striving for justice. May the praise we offer be an outpouring of mercy. May the gift we lay at the feet of our great King be the very lives that God has given to us. And as we give ourselves to the task of caring for those whom God has put into our lives, may we discover that all along we have been building up the very kingdom God has given us as an inheritance. Amen.
invite you to rise as you're able, folks. As together with the whole church on earth, we confess our faith using the word of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to be seated. Longing for Christ's reign to come among us, we pray for the outpouring of God's power on the church, the world, and all in need. Sovereign of all, train our ears to hear your cry and the needs of those around us. Bless all social ministries of the church through which we seek to serve others as we ourselves have been served. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You cause rain to fall on the just and unjust alike. Direct our use of creation to provide for the needs of all people in ways that are sustainable for the earth. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Bring peace to every place where conflict rages. Grant opportunities for ending divisions among us and usher in your reign of unity and reconciliation. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Heal the sinful divisions we erect between us and release us from systems of oppression and prejudice. Restore our capacity to see your image in those whose dignity we have stripped away. Watch over all those who are sick or hurting. We pray especially for Michael, Anna Marie, Al, Pat, Jeff, David, Barbara, Jean, Mitzi, James, John, Don, Danny, Terry, Dave, Dawn, Molly, Robert, Jillian, Millie, Don, Kate, Deborah, Sharon, Steve, Jim, Pat, the Kellerman family, the George family. And for all those we name before you now aloud or in the silence of our hearts. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Pour out the gifts of your spirit on children and youth throughout the church. Sustain those who work in children's ministry, youth ministry, and campus ministry as they nurture the gifts of young people. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We give you thanks for saints now departed who fed the hungry clothed the naked, tended to the sick. Inspire us by their example that we may see your presence in those in need around us. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Receive our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Until that day when you gather all creation around your throne, where you will reign forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. 
Being along at home to have bread or wine, bread and wine or crackers and juice with you. As we are reminded once again that on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, we pray as Jesus taught. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial. Deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to be seated. All are welcome at the Lord's table, beloved. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Beloved, this is the body of Christ, given for you, and given for me. Beloved, this is the blood of Christ, shed for you, and shed for me. Now may this body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace unto life everlasting. Amen. Amen. I invite you to rise as you are able for the benediction. Now may the God of all creation in whose image we are made, who claims us and calls us beloved, who strengthens us for service, give you reason to rejoice and be glad. The blessing of God, sovereign, savior, and spirit, be with you now and always. Amen. 
Let us join our hearts and voices in our closing song, Crown Him with Many Crowns. this place, may you share the peace of Christ with everyone you meet, in every way that you can. Thank you.